So take a second and uh, think about some of the uh, investments that you've made in your life. Good, bad, some that have gone up, some that have shrunk. I'm not talking about just financial. I'm talking about just any kind of investment of your time. What's been good? What's been bad? I think about some of the investments I've made. The best investment I ever made was I spent $2,000 at Round Man Jewelry in Clinton, Mississippi. I bought an uh, engagement ring from, for Tammy Lynn Holloway. And, uh, man, it was, a, it was a big problem because um, I had worked uh, in hay, and I had worked uh, putting in sprinkler systems, and I had put that money away. And, man, I really wanted a new truck. I really did. It was a hard decision. I was like, this lady's going to get away from me if I don't go ahead and go ahead and hook her, though. So I bought that uh, wedding ring. And this guy that I bought it from, I'm pretty sure he was in the mafia. He's in, he's in Mississippi, but he looked like he, somebody run the mafia in uh, New York City or somewhere. But anyway, so I bought that. That was a really good investment. Another good investment I made in my life, I, I, my first job that I had in, with my with my college uh, knowledge was a uh, job at the Alabama Journal in uh, Montgomery, Alabama. And I worked for a guy named Bill Brown, who was the executive editor, one of the wisest people I've ever been around. After about three days there, he said, uh, Jim, uh, if you don't invest in uh, this 401k program that we have that matches your dollars, I'm going to fire you. Bill, I, I make $12,800 a year. I don't have money for some kind of faraway deal where I, you know, I'm, I'm you know, I, I you know, I, I really didn't have any intention of getting old. I really, I was, I'm going to stay 21 years old for the rest of my life. But he, he said, he said, this is an ultimatum. I'm going to fire you if you don't put some money in there. Well, I can tell you right now at 54 years of age, I am so glad that Bill Brown threatened to fire me because I look at that money and go, yeah, that's, that's a good thing that he made me do that, that all these years. Another good investment. Uh, every time I've ever talked to my mom or my dad, Every time I've talked to my brother and my sister, my wife, my sons, Ethan and Spencer, every time I've ever sat down and talked with them have always been great investments of my time. I never regret the times that I've spent talking with them. And I, I also never, ever regret any time that I have invested in talking to somebody about Jesus. You know, sometimes people, you know, they're not ready. That's okay. But I've never regretted any conversation I've ever had with, about Jesus with somebody. Let's talk about some of the bad investments. All right, this is news you can use today. Do not spend $13 to go see Uncle Drew. That's a bad movie. It's not funny. It should have been funny. I love Shaq. I love Kyrie Irving. And it should have been funny, but it wasn't. It just stank. I would have been better off to throw my $13 in the offering buckets when they come around. As a matter of fact, why don't you do that? If you thought you considered going to that movie, just dump it right in there. All right? Uh, another bad investment. Um, I've got two pairs of Jordans. I can't dunk. I thought it, I thought it would be the shoes. It's not the shoes. It's a bad investment. And I, I bought countless uh, bats and, and equipment that I all thought would make me a superstar, you know, athlete of some kind. It has not panned out that way. Just not, not happening. I, you know, I bought all the marketing and everything else. It just didn't work. Probably one of the worst investments I've had, if I can be serious for just a moment, is that when I was, uh, and I'm not down on, the organization American Legion, but I played American Legion baseball when I was six. Started when I was playing 16 years old, and uh, I thought I really thought I was going to be a major league baseball player. I went to a tryout camp for the New York Mets, but I spent every during the spring and summer. I spent every Saturday and Sunday playing American Legion baseball. I played a doubleheader on Saturday. I played a doubleheader on Sunday. Guess what that means? Jim didn't go to church when he was in high school. I mean, I just thought the best thing for me is since I was going to be a baseball player, uh, I was just going to spend my time playing baseball. And I had a lot of fun, but man, that was a bad investment. Who knew I was going to tear something loose on my shoulder I'd never get any further than uh, second year of college. I didn't know that. God knew it. I didn't know it. But here, here's the problem is, uh, you know, the first time I went to youth camp is when I went as a leader when I was 22 years old. That's the first time I went to youth camp. But here's the deal, and this is for, for you guys that are teenagers and you're, you're making a lot of decisions on your own here, and you, maybe you can really lay this on to other folks. Because I didn't go to church and I never was involved in a youth group but for those three years of my life, when I went to college, I got barbecued. I was not ready for the challenge that I faced because I hadn't made any investment in learning about the kingdom of God and learning about how to, to 
to act in a way that would be pleasing to God. And I didn't know how to make decisions when I was on my own because I'd never been trained and I'd never had people who I was accountable to because the only person I was accountable to was my baseball coach uh, on my teams in the summer and when I played in high school. And I'm not down on sports. I love sports. It's, it's something that's huge. But you, you got to understand that you're making an investment for forever with all your time. And so where you invest your time now matters when you get to college and it matters for eternity. So invest your time wisely. We're going to talk about investing today. We're going to talk about investment in the kingdom of God. We're going to talk about mustard seeds, and we're going to talk about faith. And so if you will jump in with me, we're going to read from Mark 4, 26 through 32. And I'm going to cheat a little bit because I'm going to go into the book of Matthew too because we're going to cover mustard seeds in a big way today. They're mentioned five, the term mustard seed is mentioned five times in the, in the New Testament. And so I think we're going to jump on it pretty hard today. So if you would... Uh, if you've got your copy of God's Word, whether it's on your phone, tablet, or uh, print, whatever you've got, let's read uh, Mark 4, 26 and 32. If you'd stand with me and read with me to honor God's Word, that would be fantastic. So Jesus is talking and he says this, The kingdom of God is like this, he said. A man scatters seed on the ground. He sleeps and rises night and day. The seed sprouts and grows, although he doesn't know how. The soil produces a crop by itself. First the blade, then the head, then the full grain on the head. As soon as the crop is ready, he sends for the sickle, but because the harvest time has come. And he said, what can we compare the kingdom of God, or what parable can we use to describe it? It's like a mustard seed that when sown upon the soil is the smallest of all the seeds on the ground. And when it's sown, it comes up and grows taller than all the garden plants and produces large branches so that the birds of the sky can nest in its shade. Would you pray with me? God, we, uh, we confess to you that we don't understand all of what we read in your parables, and we don't understand everything about salvation, and we don't always understand about our role in your kingdom. So we pray, I pray today that you would teach us something we need to know about how to grow your kingdom and how to have better and stronger faith in you to grow your kingdom. Jesus, there are people in here that know I am the biggest sinner in the place right now. But God, I pray that you would speak through me anyway and that you would teach us something we need to know through your word. We ask all these things in the precious and powerful name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. So let's talk about seeds here for just a minute. There's, there's a lot going on here about seeds. It talks about Jesus talks about sowing the seeds and it comes up and it's a mystery and we don't know how that's happening. He's talking about salvation here. You know, I, I don't remember, I remember when I was saved, when I was truly saved, but man, there are so many different people who were planting and doing things around me, but God was just kind of orchestrating the whole process. I had a fourth grade Sunday school teacher who invested into me. His name was Joe Moss and he didn't even know what he was, I mean, he didn't know how powerfully he was investing in me. And then I had coaches and I had friends and my quarterback that, uh, when I played high school football, my quarterback was a great witness to me and a great, he just poured into me and then I look up and I'm 18 years old I'm face to face with my sin and I really give my heart and soul to Jesus and I'm going to tell you I don't understand all that's happening and that's what that first part of that scripture passage is talking about that it's mysterious we don't know I don't, we don't know what God uses to always save us but we just know when it happens and we know when there's a harvest and we know there's always a deadline for, for you know God may be working in our lives through the Holy Spirit through the person of Jesus but there's always a harvest. There's always got to be a day when there's a decision that says, I'm giving it all to you, Jesus. I'm all in for you. And there's a deadline. We know there's a deadline where there's going to be a day where it's going to be too late to make decisions. So Jesus is talking about all that there. We're going to jump into that next little passage, though. And we're going to talk about mustard seed. So what, do you, so what, what in the world is a mustard seed? Well, I'm going to tell you, I could not find... A mustard seed in Mount Juliet yesterday to save my life. I couldn't find the seeds. I could, all I could find was ghoul and spicy brown mustard or just your basic yellow. And by the way, while Phil Wilson's not here today, ketchup and mustard on every hamburger. Yeah. <laughs> it must be done. I don't understand people don't eat ketchup. I don't get it. Anyway, so what's a mustard seed? How big is it? It's that big. I mean, that is, it is the smallest seed that actually produces something you can eat. It is tiny, tiny, tiny. And I couldn't even, if I was holding it up here, you wouldn't even be able to see it. But it is as small as it gets. There's all kinds of great seeds, but it's a very, it's a tiny one. So this is just out, a bunch of them lined up. But you put that in the ground, and then if you let it go, it does this. It'll cover a whole ground. Uh, Paul Walker's told me at the first service today that, he, that he's seen this fields of mustard 
in, uh, in Kentucky. And what happens is the mustard greens, you know, you can eat those and you use them in hot sauce and that kind of thing. But it'll cover over a field and usually the, it's kind of a shrub, but it'll grow five, six feet tall and people cultivate it. The mustard seeds are ground up and that's how you make mustard out of it. But here's the deal. In Israel, they, the, the, the mustard seed, the mustard bush will grow up to between 9 and 12 and even 15 feet sometimes. So it gets to where it's, like a, it's almost like a tree even though it's a shrub. But here's the characteristics of a, of a mustard seed. Once, it, once mustard plant starts growing, no weeds can grow in. It just completely overwhelms everything. It grows and it spreads and nothing else can grow in there. It just takes over. It is irresistible. So when Jesus talks about the mustard seed and he talks about his kingdom, this is what he is, this is what he's talking about. So just think about this just a second. So there is this poor carpenter who's born in a stable in Israel. And from that comes Right now in our world today, there are 2.19 billion Christians in the world today. So we have this Jesus who the Bible tells us he's not a good looking guy. Nothing would draw you to him. And so this poor carpenter from this poor family comes a worldwide movement that overtakes everything. It's pretty amazing, isn't it? When you talk about um, unstoppable God... When you sing about unstoppable God, that's what you're singing about. 2.19 billion Christians in the world today. It goes from tiny. When the movement of Jesus started, it was just him, and then it was the 12. And then when Jesus died, was resurrected, and then ascended into heaven, it was 120 people. Those, that was the entire, that was the whole uh, cast of the followers of Christ. And somehow or another, it overtook the entire Roman Empire to the point where Constantine was the, uh, was the emperor. He made Christianity the state religion. How did that happen? How did that even, how did that even, how, how is that even a thing? There were people who were burned uh, and used as torches for the, city, for the city of Rome. They went from being outcast and being revolutionaries to be, that's the state religion of Rome. How does that even happen? He's irresistible. Unstoppable. That's who God is. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, our group got back this past Friday uh, from uh, Rwanda. Friday a week ago from Rwanda. Um, our guy who, uh, Phil Johnsy, who runs Church Missions Network, talked to uh, the, the Minister of Health in Rwanda, and he said, you know, I know that you want to do these health clinics where you give out these drugs and all this other stuff and you try to help people. Nobody's going to come to those things. You're, you're, you're just wasting your time. There were almost 4,000 people that came and got prescriptions for, for illnesses and, and got treated for diseases on that trip, our group that went to Rwanda. 4,000 people, almost 4,000 people. 781 of them became followers of Christ. Isn't that amazing? Unstoppable God, unstoppable force, right? How does that happen? I guess that the minister was, I guess he wasn't right, was he? You can't stop God. He's going to do what he does. He's going to build his kingdom. What's interesting about that is if you go back in that verse, it's, it says, Jim, what's that stuff about the birds, about the birds building the branches in the, in the mustard? What all, what's all that all about? Um, as I read it and as I understand it, birds represent people that aren't believers in Christ yet. But they're, they're, they're people who get blessings from the kingdom of God, even though they're not believers. So the people, we wrote, uh, I think our group wrote 15,000 prescriptions for, for uh, illnesses that if you couldn't be treated in Rwanda. But there, you know, so there's only 781 that accepted Christ, but there are 15,000 people, there are 15,000 prescriptions written. So there are people that are not believers who got good and got health and got treatment even though they're not followers of Christ. Isn't that interesting? So the birds still got to nest in the kingdom of God and still receive benefit from the kingdom of God, even though they hadn't become followers of Christ yet. That's what we're supposed to be about. We're, even people who are, who are far from God, we're supposed to be building a place where they can rest and find comfort and find love even before they, came, they come to know Jesus. That's what that's about. 
let's talk about what's happening in the world today. I know that sometimes you think, well, you know, is, is the movement of Jesus, is it really rolling? You know, because I'm not sure I see all that. Let's talk about this. Christianity is growing at an amazing rate in the country of Iran. You think, Iran? That's a, that's a Muslim country. That's an Islamic nation. Thousands of people are being baptized. I saw a video of 20 people being baptized in a canal in secret the other day. Uh, there's a, a TV station, a TV network called Mohabbat TV. It, it's broadcast in Farsi, which is uh, a, the, the kind of the key language in Iran. People are coming to, they're, they're, they're coming to faith in Christ from house to house. So they're doing house churches, house groups, and they're talking about Jesus, and people are getting saved over and over and over again. People are realizing the Islamic faith is bankrupt and empty. You realize more people have converted from Islam to Christianity in the first 18 years of this century than ever before. That's crazy. From 2000 to 2018, more people have converted to Christianity from Islam than ever before. You think God's an unstoppable God? You think he's going to make his kingdom come? You think it's going to grow and it's going to be irresistible? You got it. That can happen here in Wilson County. It needs to happen. Revival needs to happen here. It happens house to house, person to person, heart to heart. That's how God operates. That's how he does it. That's his pattern from the book of Acts where 5,000 were saved in one day and 3,000 were saved in one day. I know we had 118 people baptized at Easter, but God has bigger things in store here. And he wants you to be involved in it. In China... There are 67 million Chinese Christians. Think about that just a little bit. There were 4 million Chinese Christians in 1949. You talk about investment, you talk about growing the kingdom, it's happening. 1,200 churches have been persecuted this year, and 80,000 Chinese Christians have been jailed for their faith this year. That sounds bad, doesn't it? Chinese Christians view Jail and prison as seminary, as a place where they learn to grow in their faith because there are so many Christians locked up in jails. It's viewed as seminary. There's teaching of the word that's happening there every single day. And when they get out, you know what they do? They go to their homes and they do, they start churches. They start home groups of new believers until they get thrown back in jail again. But they've already given their faith away so that people come to that, that they'll be there to keep it going. Uh, there's a guy uh, who's a pretty famous pastor who's the head of a mission group here in the United States. His name is David Platt. He does a thing called Secret Church, and he learned that from Chinese Christians where they, they black out all their curtains and their windows, and they study the Word of God even though it's against the law, even though they may go to jail, even though they're going to be persecuted. And somehow the kingdom of God keeps on growing and keeps moving. Unstoppable God, new wine, new believers every step of the way. That's how God operates. That's how he does his work. You know, um, Jesus is a, um, we talked about he's a poor carpenter. Nothing, nothing was, you know, ex exceptional about him until he opened his mouth and the word of God came out and it blew people away. One man, fully man, fully God, 12 disciples, 120 3,000 in a day, 5,000 in a day, 2.19 billion Christians. We serve an unstoppable God who is not going to stop until every person hears the name of Jesus and knows salvation. He is not going to stop. He's not going to be defeated. He's undefeated. And you know what? I skipped to the back of the Bible, book of Revelation. I cheated. I like to do that. I sometimes read the end of books before I get all the way through it. He wins. And we win. So don't ever think that the kingdom of God is not moving on. And he wants to grow the kingdom of God through you. Through you. So let's take a couple of, let's do a couple of uh, directives from this parable of the mustard seed. What are we supposed to learn? Number one, plant the right seed. Plant the right seed. The kingdom of God is undefeated. Jesus never loses. God always keeps his promises. And one day the sky is going to be split open and Jesus is going to return. That's going to happen when every person's heard the good news. Jesus is going to win the final battle at Armageddon. He's going to kick Satan's butt just like he kicked Satan's butt at Calvary. And it's going to be over with. And then everybody's time has run out. 
But he's going to give everybody a chance to get to know him before that happens. So knowing all that and knowing all these numbers I threw at you, why would you do anything but plant the right seed during your time on earth? Well, let me give you a reason. This is why I don't because, man, I like to be comfortable. I like to do what Jim does. I like to build Jim's, Jim's kingdom and not God's kingdom. You know, everybody likes to drive a nice car. Everybody likes to have a nice home, have a good career, have a right boyfriend or girlfriend or wife or husband. And we just get real busy building our own kingdom. And that's not what God has for us. There are two reasons why you are here on earth. Let's look at them. These are the only two in his word. To bring glory to God, to tell about his fame, to spread his fame to everybody, every corner of the earth, everybody you know. That's your job. To bring glory to God with your life, with your actions, with your words, with the way you work, everything you do, you bring glory to God. And the second is to build his kingdom. To build his kingdom where you're planted, which is right now in Wilson County, Tennessee. That's your job. That's why you're created. That's why you're born. That is your purpose. That is your purpose. So, so, so what does it mean to plant the right seed? If that's my purpose, what does that mean? Last week, uh, last Saturday, a, bunch, a group of us went to, uh, to help uh, finish off a build for Habitat for Humanity uh, over on Park Avenue in Lebanon. And uh, there's, a, there's, there's a single lady there named Hillary, and there's a couple, uh, there's a family of four. The husband's name is Alawi, um, and we were building, uh, finishing off the home for them, okay? And I can't think of anything better than to give somebody a home, right? If you're homeless and you don't have a home, or if you live like this couple from Egypt, they lived in a really tough area in Nashville, and they needed a safe place to live, um, I can't think of anything better than giving somebody a home, right? But here's the deal. If you don't speak Jesus into somebody's life, giving someone a gift of a home or giving them food or whatever else you give them is not the best thing. The best thing you can possibly give them is the power of Jesus and, the, and, and everything about Jesus, his story. Give them your story. Tell them how Jesus has, has, has changed your life. But that's the right seed is planting the kingdom of God in their lives. Now, Jesus' pattern is to do this. He met physical needs first. So you give somebody a home, you give somebody food, you take care of them, you do things like that. And then Jesus says, hey, but I, I'm your salvation. So you want to meet physical needs, you want to take care of people, but you also want to give them Jesus. And that's, that's really what the early Christians did. That's where the explosive growth in Christianity in Rome came from. They told people about Jesus, but the first thing they did was there were all kinds of plagues in Rome, all kinds of diseases, and all the other Roman folks, they got out of town, they just left people dying in Rome. You know who the people were that took care of people who were, having, who were, who were, who were diseased and were struggling with plagues? They were Christians, and they didn't care whether they died or whether they lived. They were going to show love to people who needed it, and they were going to give them Jesus. That is the recipe for explosive growth of Christianity. Meet physical needs, love people, love your neighbors, and give them Jesus. And say, this is why I'm doing this. This is why I'm loving you in this way because Jesus has loved me in this way. And that's what makes Christianity grow and that's what makes it unstoppable because there's an unstoppable God who's driving every bit of this. So plant the right seed in their lives. Plant the right seed uh, for people who you know in your, in your place, in your places, in the places that you go every day. All right, so you guys know I'm the group's pastor here, and I do discipleship, so you know where I'm going to go with this, okay? So how do I plant the right seed uh, in my life? Well, I don't have any new ideas, okay? In the book of Acts, it talks about people going into homes in small groups, eating, praying, and studying the Bible together. So I don't have any new ideas. I'm just going to give you the basic Jesus ideas that I know from the book of Acts. So here's what I'm going to ask you to do. Um, on July the 26th, we're going to have a meeting here for people who are going to be new life group leaders. And that's men's groups, women's groups, whatever, uh, couples groups, whatever else. But we need desperately to get the kingdom of God built in Wilson County. There are 160,000 people that live in Wilson County, students, um, children, Adults, and we, you know, the only way it's going to happen, the way that Jesus wants it to happen, is that every neighborhood, 
every community, every little area has a group where people are talking about Jesus, they're studying his word, and that's how, that's the pattern of Christianity. And you say, well, Jim, um, I'm already in a group. Great, you're in a group. How long have you been in it? Well, I've been in there about a year. Guess what? You're qualified to start a new group. Start a new group in your workplace. Start a group at, at, a, at a coffee shop or at a Panera or something like that. Start a group in your house. Men's, women's, couples groups, whatever it is. We, we, that's the way this happens. It multi, it's multiplication. We didn't go from 120 people who are Christ followers to $2.19 billion with you sitting where you are and not moving and spreading the kingdom of God. So I need you to do that. Some of you are way overqualified to be leading a group. Some of you have been in a group for three or four years here, and there's something you can give to somebody else, and you're just, just kind of sitting still. Here's the issue. I don't know everybody in Wilson County. There's 160,000 people, but the, there are people that you know that I'll never meet. So I'm going to ask you to, I'm going to ask you to invite three or four people or three or four couples to your house and start a group. And you don't have to do anything. There's nothing real magical about this. You, you, you get some food, make some food. Some of you, even if you're bad cooks, it'll be okay. It'll be all right. That's what, that's what fast food places are for. That's what pizza places are for. Open, open the Word of God. Start in the book of Mark and go through it and just, just talk about it. Invite your friend group. Invite the people that you have influence with and just do it. But this meeting that we're doing on August on uh, July 26th, we're going to feed you dinner. I'll, we'll teach you how to lead a life group. It's not rocket science. We'll equip you in every way possible and walk through that with you and help you start a group. But that is the pattern of how Jesus has spread throughout the world. House to house, heart to heart. It's all about Jesus and spreading his kingdom that way. So how does that work? Well, they had a, had a, a, a guy named Brett Neal who's in our church. I don't know if he's been here this morning. If he's here, I'm not going to probably embarrass him. He started a life group exactly the worst possible time. At the end of spring, at the beginning of summer, when everybody's leaving town, and guess what? It was in his neighborhood, and it's already full. He's got 12 adults, six couples, and 16 kids that comes. It's already bigger than his house can handle. Isn't that amazing? It's almost like that was the original design, right? <clears throat> Every group that we start... It has an amazing impact because it touches people who don't know Jesus. And, and the, the folks that were in Brett's group, most of them didn't even come to the bridge. That's the design for God's plan, planting the right seed where you need to go. And, it, and you can do it any number of ways. My, my friend Kevin Owen, um, he has a passion for bicycles, and he is uh, restoring bicycles. Uh, it's called Chains of Hope is his ministry. And every time he restores a bicycle and sells it, he gives money for a specific purpose at the bridge. And what he gave, he wrote a check, and oh, he didn't write a check, he gave online yesterday, and he put it toward a family who desperately needs a car who's uh, being impacted by another life group in our church. That is having a kingdom mentality. That's about growing the kingdom. So if you're starting a group or you're directing things toward kingdom growth, that's what you want to do. That's what, what planting the right seed means. I know that there are people in here that you think you're bulletproof and you think you're going to live forever and it's, it's, it's just not true. If your life is, going, is pretty short. Please be about making it matter right now. Plant the right seed. I, uh, I played uh, high school football in uh, Mississippi, in Clinton, Mississippi, and I played right guard. I was 5'11", 175 pounds. I was the skinniest worst football player probably on our team. But I, I started at right guard. The guy next to me is a guy named Kevin Timms who's big and talented and strong and made me look good every single Friday night. I got a message between uh, services today from Kevin. He, is in, he lives in Covington, Louisiana, um, and uh, he has Lou Gehrig's disease. He's two years younger than me, and uh, he can't, he's gotten to the point where he can't speak anymore. But... Uh, our tech guys, hey, our tech guys that, that help make this happen, you're planting kingdom seeds because Kevin got online and saw the last service that we did and said, hey, keep going. He can't speak, but he can type, and he can watch a service online. Some of you, we, you don't know how long you've got. It's time for you to follow hard after Jesus, maybe accept him for the first time, and it's time for you to start planting kingdom seeds, seeds of Jesus Christ in your life now because you may not have tomorrow and you may not have the use of your limbs tomorrow and you may not be able to speak. You don't know what's going to happen to you. 
Live for the kingdom today. It's unsto- he is unstoppable. And his kingdom is unstoppable. Second directive from uh, the parable of the mustard seed. And this is where we're going to jump to Matthew. This is Matthew 17, 20. And Jesus is again speaking and he says this, Because of your little faith, he told them, For truly I tell you, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you will tell this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. So what's Jesus talking about? The disciples were trying to drive out a demon from a guy, and they couldn't do it. And they came running to Jesus and said, hey, we can't, we can't, make, we can't restore this guy. We can't get the demon out of him. What, Jesus, will you help us? What can you do? And Jesus is pretty frustrated with them because he knows that they have that, his, his power at his disposal, and they're just not using it. And he says, you don't have enough faith. If you, even had, if you had any faith, if you had faith the size of a mustard seed, if you had this much faith, you could do it. But you don't have any faith. You don't have any faith. And I'm sure, you know, the, the other accounts of this in the gospel said that, the, uh, that Jesus said you didn't pray. <laughs> you didn't even pray and ask God for his power. You just tried to do it on your own. That's pretty well the way that most of us operate, right? We try to do it all in our own power. Let's, let's look at the definition of faith. I find that uh, people don't have a real good understanding of faith. Well, you know, I, I didn't study for my test last week, but I have faith that God's going to let me pass it. That's not how it works. This is what faith means. Faith is an unshakable belief in God and the promises of God. That means that he's unstoppable, he's always going to keep his promises, and he's always going to come through when it comes to his kingdom. Okay, we're going to talk more about that. So, you know, I've been through periods. uh, There was a lady here in the first service today who has a husband who has brain cancer. And we were talking about that. We prayed before the service for her. Man, her faith is shaken, but it's still there. Uh, I went, I've gone through something really uh, tough the last month or so of my life. Um, so those of you who care for aging parents and who deal with uh, parents who have dementia or everything else, it is such a hard, hard thing. Man, I, I don't know if some of you can relate to this, but I just want to run. On, yeah, on Friday, I just wanted to run away. Man, my faith is shaken when you're trying to take care of your mom and she doesn't know, uh, she doesn't know what's happening to her. Man, that will shake your faith. That'll shake your faith. And I'm going to tell you, I don't have an answer. I don't have answers for all the things that you've gone through. I don't have answers for my buddy Kevin Timms about why he has ALS. I don't have answers about why people have cancer. But here, here's what I do have answers about. God is, is good no matter what happens to us in our circumstances individually. Life is hard. But here's what, he, here's what we can count on for him. Let's talk about some of his promises. Some of the promises that he's given us. He loves us with an everlasting love. That's in the word. You can count on it. We can all be forgiven for our sins. God will never leave us or forsake us, even when we're going through the hardest times. He will never allow us to be tempted more than we can bear. He will always give us a way out, a way to handle that temptation. He always will keep his promises. What he doesn't promise is for all of your dreams to come true. He doesn't promise you to be healthy and wealthy and wise. He doesn't promise any of those things. He promises that he will be faithful to you and he'll walk with you. But all this stuff about that he he wants you to be rich and he wants you to be famous and he wants you to have a great career, doesn't say that anywhere in the Bible. It says that he's going to grow his kingdom and he's going to save you and he wants you to be with him in eternity. That's what he says. All this other stuff we kind of make up ourselves. But what's this stuff about moving mountains? What that's, what's that all about? Got a couple of pictures of some mountains I've seen recently. This is Mount Mitchell. This is the highest point east of the Rocky Mountains. Uh, when, when I left, the, we left the valley in Asheville. It was 90 or 93 degrees, and we got up here at 65 degrees. This thing is massive. The two highest peaks east of the Rockies are within a mile of each other in North Carolina, and it is beautiful. I would have just never left if I'd had the option. And then uh, last year, we went to uh, the Tetons. Uh, in Wyoming, these bad boys are 13,000 feet to the top. You can't see the top because the clouds are obscuring them, but they are amazing. And so when I was at both these places, I was thinking about the scripture passage. God, we can move mountains? We can, we can move mountains? What's that all about? There's no way I can move a mountain. Nobody's moving a mountain. 781 people got uh, saved in Rwanda two weeks ago. It feels like a mountain moving to me. How did 118 people get baptized at Easter at the Bridge Fellowship? Sounds like a mountain's moving to me. 
How could God save a sinner as bad as me? It took a mountain to save me. It took moving a mountain to save me. There are incredible things that are happening in China, in Iran, and in Wilson County, and in all over the world where God is moving mountains to save you and to build his kingdom. He's saving people all over the world, and you just think there's no way this can happen. There's no way God can bring good out of some of the terrible things that's happening. He is moving mountains. He's doing it, and he can do it in your life. But, but I do understand the tension here because I have every day people, because I talk to people and I pray with people, and they'd say, I have incredible faith. And I, I, God, I, I don't have a job. I need my husband or my wife or a loved one healed of a disease. God's not coming through for me. He's not moving a mountain. I, I need God to give me a husband or a wife. I need God to give me a car. I need, to give, I need him to give me a house that didn't have a leaky roof. I need you, God, to save my son or my daughter or my loved one who doesn't know you. And nothing has happened. And you go, God, this whole thing about mustard seed faith and moving mounds, I don't, I don't see it. I don't see you. So what does he say? When it comes to the kingdom of God, nothing is impossible. But sometimes, you know, I don't know about you guys, but I get in the way. And this is where it's hard to understand. You know, when I sit uh, and, I, and I watch somebody in a doctor's office with a loved one who has cancer, and they're not getting any good answers. And I wonder, where, where's that moving of mountains there? But then God shows up and I realize the lady who is with her husband who has cancer is speaking love and truth and talking to Jesus about somebody there in that room that they would have never met had they not been united by a terrible disease. And then I see that God is moving mountains to make salvation happen in a way that I would never create it myself. And he does that over and over again. Through the worst of circumstances, he creates good. He promises that he will take what was meant for evil and turn it into good. He does it over and over and over again. But Jim, that doesn't feel very good to me. I know. It doesn't feel very good to me either. But God is going to do what, he's, what he said he's going to do, which is to grow his kingdom and to build his kingdom. And he's going to do whatever it takes to do that. Here's one reason sometimes why we don't get what we're looking for. James 4.3 says this. You ask and you don't receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasures. I ask for things that aren't in God's will. Do you? Man, I do that all the time. I got my whole wish list here. Just like it's Christmas time. Let me roll it down here. I got a thousand things I want. God says, maybe your heart's not in the right place. Maybe the things you want aren't the things that are, that are, that are, that are needed in my kingdom. So he's saying, if you, want, if you want to move mountains, get on my program. All the time, I pray for God to build my kingdom. Do you do that? Do you pray for God to build your kingdom? And what I need to be doing is I need to ask God, Show me how I can build your kingdom. That's what's important. Even in the hardest of situations, in the most difficult of diseases, in situations where you can't find a job or you're having trouble with money, God, how in the midst of this trial can I build your kingdom? And God says, nobody who's a believer of mine is going to pass into heaven and know me and know my salvation unless you go through trials and tribulations. The Bible tells us that. That's the way it works. But he says, I will involve you in building my kingdom if you will come alongside me. I want to tell you what mustard seed faith is not. It's not a blank check to get what we want. Let me give you a couple of things that I see from the Bible that says that's not true. Jesus asked God to take the cup from me and spare him from the crucifixion. God said, no, this is my plan. Let's go for it. Jesus, thank God. Jesus accepted the assignment and went through with died a most terrible death and he saved us all even when he didn't want to do it because he was human just like we are. But he knew that the only way we get saved is if he went through with the crucifixion and death and resurrection. So he, he did what God asked him to do even when he didn't want to do it. Paul and Timothy both had health issues. They were never healed, even though both of them prayed for it. We have, we have a record of that in the Bible where Paul is asking for this, this thorn in the side to be removed from him. And God said, no. It's essential 
for what you do in ministry? He said, no. Eleven of the, of the disciples were killed for their faith. The children of Israel wandered in the desert for 40 years, and their leader Moses never entered the promised land. The list goes on and on about lives that were shattered for following Jesus, but they were spreading the kingdom of God. It's a list of prayers that were answered by God with a resounding no. God's going to do things in a way that sometimes we just don't understand. I want to give you a little parable. Since Jesus is, is, uh, is speaking in parables, I want to give you a Nashville parable. You don't know this, but I'm the next Carrie Underwood. <laughs> My legs are not quite as good. And in fact, I probably need to shave them. But I've got a set of pipes on me, and I've got more musical talent than anybody in this town. I work, I currently work at the Waffle House on 109. <laughs> Tell me if you've heard this story, if you know this story. I've uh, slept in my car for most of the time that I've been here. Uh, I moved here from a little town in Mississippi, but I got a whole lot of talent, and God's going to make my dream come true. I've already worked it out with him. I'm going to give, when I become a star, I'm going to give millions of dollars from the church to the church. And I'm going uh, to start medical missions all over the world. And all this money that God's going to give me, I'm going to give him a little bit of it so he can do, build his kingdom. I'm ready to roll. And, you know, I, there, there are a lot of people in town that have a lot of great talent that never make it, right? You know, I mean, this town is full of people who have musical talent. This little town, though, that I'm from in Mississippi, I have great, great influence in that town. And there are 150 people in that town, or 15, or five, or one, who will come to know Jesus through my influence and through God using me in their lives. But that can't happen as long as I'm in Nashville, Tennessee, trying to pursue a music career. So God crushes my dream. He doesn't allow me to be a star in the music industry. He sends me back home to this little town in Mississippi. And 150 or 15 or 5 or even just one person is saved. And his kingdom is grown and built. I know it's a hard truth. But that's how God operates. Sometimes your dreams, your personal dreams, are not going to be fulfilled. They're not going to become true because God has bigger and better plans for you than being a star or building fame. It says very clearly in God's word, it is his will that none of us should perish and go to hell. And his ultimate goal is not to make you happy, comfortable, or famous. His goal is that everyone would be saved. And he wants to use you to achieve that goal. And he may not do it the way that you dream that he's going to do it. But he's going to do it. Because he's an unstoppable God. And his will is going to happen. Even if it doesn't make us happy. It's a hard truth. But it's real truth. And that's one that translates in our world today because there's, there's just so many people here that come here with a dream and they're just convinced that God's going to let it happen. So with all this in mind, and it's a little troubling, so what is, how can I build my faith? I want to give you three things as we close to talk about building your faith. One is ask God to rule in your life. Well, Jim, I don't feel like it today. I don't want God to rule in my life. I want to do what I want to do today. I'm saved, but I'm just not on the Jesus plan today. I just need a day off. Jesus gives faith. It's all his power. And it's all about him. When you understand it's his power that makes everything happen, you will have all the faith you need. You'll grow all the faith that you could possibly need when you allow yourself to live under his rule. So do that. Number two. Focus on obeying God. You want to move mountains? You want to be used of God in a powerful way? Obey him in the little things that he's already, he's already given you to do. You know, you know what the truest evidence of faith is in your life? Is if you love God and you love your neighbor. 
If you love God and you love the people around you and you're willing to forgive them and to, and to just love them with an everlasting love and never give up on them, I'll show you. That's a person that has mountain-moving faith. If you live that out, if you obey God in all the things that he's commanded you to do, he's going to allow you to move mountains. It may not be the mountains you want moved, but it's going to be the mountains that he wants moved. So that's one way you can grow in your faith. Focus on obeying God. Three, Phil talked about this last week. This is just true. Put God's word in your mind. Read and memorize his word consistently. What that does, it gives you a kingdom mindset. You, if, you're, if you're just focusing on God's word and you're waking up every day and you're starting your day in God's word and you're memorizing his word, it gives you his perspective on things. It gives you a kingdom perspective so that you understand that the most important thing for you is to not have the money that you want or the car that you want or, the, or date the person you want. The most important thing is that we're, we're building God's kingdom. And being in his word will change your mind. It will transform your mind. It will renew you. It will give you unshakable faith. And it will give you perspective. I want to give you a little caution here. There's a guy back in the 1520s. His name was Thomas Munzer. And uh, he started a revolution in Germany. uh, And it was all based on spiritual revelation. And he he caused these people to go into rebellion. And uh, a bunch of people got killed. And it was all about spiritual revelation. It was nothing about what was real from the Word of God. So if you want to develop a mountain-moving faith, get your head in the Word of God and not let it be about experiences. If you have an experience or you have a revelation that's not in the Word of God and it's not matching there, you're going to end up destroying yourself. You're going to be on the fast track to hell. God doesn't speak anything to you that's not first put down in his word that's how it works that's his revelation to us get into his word you want to grow your faith you want to move mountains you want to build the kingdom of God get into his word and get your assignment I want to give you an opportunity today this is not um, this is not a, a message in a service where you will get to walk out of here without without doing something. We get a very clear command from Jesus that says, my kingdom is going to overcome everything. It's irresistible. I need you to be a part of it. I need you to grow my kingdom. So I need you to make a commitment to me today. If you're a follower of Christ, I need you to make a commitment that you will go into your school, that you'll go into your neighborhood, into your workplace, um, and you will start building the kingdom. I need some of you today to tell me, hey, I'm coming to this life group leader meeting. I'm going to figure out how to start a kingdom movement in my neighborhood, in my community, in my area of the world. And I'm not just going to sit in somebody else's group and get fed. I'm going to get started in growing the kingdom of God. I need some of you to bite on that today. I need some of you to say, you know what? There are people uh, in, in my, you know, in my school, there are people that I know that they have never come to know Christ before. I'm going to speak truth in their life, and I'm going to lead with love, and I'm going to make that happen. I'm going to grow the kingdom of God. And God, because I'm making a commitment to do this, I'm going to claim your promise that you're going to move mountains. There are people around me that I think that they're just too far gone, but I'm stepping into their lives, and I'm stepping into their lives with your love and your message, and I'm going to count on you to move mountains. He's going to do it because he's promised that he will do it. He will move mountains if you have just a little bit of faith any faith he'll move mountains for you if it's about building his kingdom finally there's some of you today that you, this is kind of all kind of just it might as well be Chinese to you because you've never you've never met Jesus before before you leave here today ask Jesus to forgive you of every sin you've ever committed Ask him to change your life. Ask him to show you the way. Ask him to transform the way that you think, the way that you live, the way that you do everything, and he will do it. He is unstoppable. He is irresistible. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And he came to earth to save you. 
He came to save me. And there's not one person that is exempt from that promise. And if you're sitting here today and you're thinking, well, you don't know me. You're right, I don't know you. But Jesus made you. He created you. He knows everything you've done. He knows every regret you have. And he still says, I am enough. I died to save you. Come to me. Let me change your life. Let me give you purpose. Come to me today.